Well, as you've already heard, we're continuing in Psalm 119, and what I'd like to do is read the section we're going to be looking at this evening. And again, what, um, <coughs> what we want to look at is in the midst of the psalmist's difficulties, and he begins to express a little bit more about what it was he was experiencing, uh, what his attitude was, particularly towards the law of God, and what we want to try to understand this evening is why he was so intent on following God's commandments under this difficulty, what the connection was between that and the deliverance that he hoped to receive from the Lord. Uh, and we see that he certainly did expect that, and it's something that every believer should expect, that when we seek the Lord for His mercies, that the Lord will give them to us. But again, there are certain conditions under which He will give us those things because there are certain things, as we understand, He's trying to teach us. Uh, through the difficulties that we actually experience. So this is what the psalmist says in this particular section in verses 81 through 88. My soul languishes for your salvation. I wait for your words. My eyes fail with longing for your word while I say, when will you comfort me? Though I have become like a wineskin in the smoke, I do not forget your statutes. How many are the days of your servant? When will you execute judgment on those who persecute me? The arrogant have dug pits for me, men who are not in accord with your law. All your commandments are faithful. They have persecuted me with a lie. Help me. They almost destroyed me on earth. But as for me... I did not forsake your precepts. Revive me according to your loving kindness so that I may keep the testimony of your mouth. Again, may the Lord bless uh, this portion of His Word to our, our hearing, our understanding uh, this evening. Now, last time we saw, I think, several reasons why it is we should obey God, and actually there's a myriad of them throughout um, the book or throughout this particular, well, certainly throughout the book, but throughout this particular psalm. And last week we saw that the reason why we should obey God is because that is the reason, that's the purpose for which He made us. Uh, not that we would rebel, not that we would seek our own pleasure uh, in fulfilling our fleshly desires, but that we might actually find our pleasure in serving Him. And again, if we understand just how wonderful love is, Loving the Lord, being loved by Him, loving others, even if we're not loved by them, it's more blessed to give than to receive, and we understand that, and that's what He calls us to do. We understand that He's called us to a very high calling. It's a blessing uh, to be made for this purpose. And certainly when we fell into sin, the Lord redeemed us by His Son and gave us His Spirit so that this purpose may be renewed in us. This is our reason for existence, that we might serve Him. But we also saw another reason we should obey Him is that through our obedience, we might encourage one another to obey. You know how encouraging it is when you see somebody who really is taking the things of the Lord seriously. It, it really, um, well, gives you, as, as it were, that needed boost uh, to, to not only know that, uh, it, it's, it's, that others are doing it, but to know that it's possible to do it. We need to seek to obey that we might be examples. And thirdly, we saw that we need to obey in order to encourage others when they see the blessings that God gives for obedience. Uh, as we obey and the Lord grants us His, His grace and His mercy, it encourages those who are aware of our situation to do the same thing, that they might inherit those same blessings. Now, this evening, we're going to look more closely at the relationship between the promises that God offers to us and our personal obedience. We're going to look at other aspects of obedience as well. But we do want to answer this question. Does God require obedience before He will give us what He has promised? Well, the answer to that question is yes, and what we want to try to understand is why. Why does God require this? Well, Let's consider that for a few moments, and we'll look at two things. First of all, that God does uh, fulfill His promises when you obey. There is a connection between the two. And secondly, 
why He requires that obedience uh, before He will give what is promised. So first of all, let's consider that God fulfills His promises when you obey. And I believe that I've already drawn your attention to the connection that our passage shows between obedience and blessing. Uh, Earlier, we've seen hints that the psalmist was undergoing some kind of attack. And here, we see that he also knew what it is that he had to do in the midst of that attack before he could expect God to deliver him according to his promise. So we see the attack, we see his response to it, but we see his expectation. His expectation was deliverance, but why did he expect deliverance? Well, it's because, as we saw, I think, in great detail in Psalm 18, it was because of his obedience, which is why he is seeking the Lord even more earnestly, that he might obey. Now, he tells us several things about what it was he was going through. He says, first of all, he was growing progressively weaker under a very severe attack. My soul languishes for your salvation. I wait for your word. Now, again, we might be tempted to think the psalmist here was languishing for God's eternal salvation as though somehow he wasn't converted. But that's not what the word salvation always refers to. I think we should assume that this psalmist who is being used by the Lord as an instrument through which he's giving us his word was already a converted man. The salvation that he's looking for is not eternal but rather temporal from some enemy some physical enemy. And again, he explains that as we go along. Uh, And again, because he's been under attack for such a long time uh, without a break, this attack is taking its toll on his spiritual well-being. The word languishing basically means that he is sort of wasting away under this difficulty. And yet, under this difficulty, he didn't lose hope. And why is it that he didn't lose hope? Well, it's because he had his eyes where they needed to be. He was looking to the Lord. He was looking to Him with the expectation that the Lord was going to deliver him. He had his eye on God's promise. I think that's what what he's looking for when he says, my soul languishes for your salvation. Well, what salvation? The salvation that He promised to those who will wait upon Him. He says, I wait for your word. And again, I do believe He has His eye on God's promise of deliverance for those who love Him and who know Him. And again, I would remind you of what it is we've been looking at in, um, well, in in Spurgeon, in the um, only a prayer meeting and the other work that has been brought up in that context called Faith's Checkbook. If God makes a promise, then you can ask for that and you can know that God is going to give it to you because He's promised it. But sometimes, like the psalmist here, sometimes you need to wait because there are other things perhaps that the Lord is is doing. And in this case, through a trial, through a difficulty, the Lord may cause us to wait before He delivers us because He wants to teach us something. Now, the next verse shows us the intensity with which the psalmist was seeking the Lord for this promise. Verse 82, my eyes fail with longing for your word while I say, when will you comfort me? Now, I think we need to see here that the psalmist was not just seeking the Lord, but he was seeking Him in a particular way with the kind of intensity that brought with it tears. Now, there are some people who are easily given to tears. It doesn't take but a drop of the hat to make them cry, but not, you know, most people aren't necessarily like that. And I think what we are to understand here is that you're brought to tears when you, you, you really earnestly desire something when your heart is so moved, as it were, with this languishing, with this anguish, and you so desire deliverance that you weep for it. And I believe that's the case with the psalmist. He really wanted the Lord's deliverance. He intensely desired that God would fulfill His promise of salvation. And let me just mention, as we're talking about prayer, 
that if God is going to answer prayer, what kind of prayer is He going to answer? If, if you offer something to Him that you're really not concerned about yourself and you really don't care whether He answers it or not, do you think He's going to be concerned about it? Do you think He's going to care about it? But if you offer your petitions with the kind of intensity that the psalmist is offering his with, do you think the Lord will pay attention to that? If you're weeping before Him because of the earnest desire that you have that He fulfill this particular request. We should be encouraged by this to seek the Lord with as much intensity as we possibly can to show Him how earnestly we desire that He give us what it is we're asking for. That, as the Puritans have told us on numerous occasions, are what causes our prayers to wing their way to heaven and to be seen and acknowledged by the Lord and that He might answer them. But again, of course, this kind of zeal can only come by walking closely with the Lord. Now, thirdly, we're told that this, this attack was taking its toll also, I believe, on his body, although certainly he may re be referring to his soul again as he talks about his soul languishing. But he says, I have become like a wineskin in the smoke. Now, most of us here have not put wineskins in smoke. We don't know what happens when, when, that, when you do that, but basically what happens is it dries it out it shrivels it up, and that's the effect that long-term attacks can have on your soul. And since the soul and body are connected, it can also have this effect on your body. So we can actually see it really affects both. David talks about how his sins had drained away his own strength, his own vitality, like the fever heat of summer. Well, prolonged suffering can do the same to your soul and the same to your health. You know, we don't usually... Think about, you know, stressful situations that, that go long-term as being situations under which we would thrive. Uh, those are the kinds of things that usually cause mental, emotional, physical breakdown. It's kind of hard to live under that pressure for very long without feeling its effects. The psalmist was feeling those effects. And why is that? Well, because fourthly, this attack had been going on for some time. The psalmist was beginning to wonder when the Lord was going to get involved, when He was going to put an end to it according to His promise, when He was going to deliver him. He appears to be wondering whether or not he was even going to survive. He says in verse 84, how many are the days of your servant? When will you execute judgment on those who persecute me? I think uh, we understand that the Lord often stretches us to the very limit when He's trying to teach us something through the difficulties that we're going through, because if He doesn't, we're not going to grow. If life were easy all the time, then we would remain the same all the time. It's, it's trial, it's adversity, it's difficulty that causes us to grow. So we shouldn't be surprised if as we are growing in the Lord, our trials become more intense and sometimes last longer. And that's one way, of course, in which the Lord actually increases the intensity, sometimes to the point where we're wondering, is the Lord ever going to show us the light of day? Well, fifthly, who was it that was persecuting him? What is the, you know, who is it? What were they doing to him? Well, we're only told in general terms. We're told the people who are persecuting him were the proud, the arrogant. He says in verse 85, the arrogant have dug pits for me, men who are not in accord with your law. Now, certainly, if you're going to be persecuted by someone, that's what you would expect them to be like. Those who are proud, those who are arrogant, those who believe themselves to be above the law, those who are full of themselves, those who are full of the world, those who were too important perhaps in their own eyes to submit to the Lord. You know, it, people who are unconverted are like their father, and their father in this case isn't God. Their father is Satan, and they do the works of their father. That's what Jesus tells us. Well, what is Satan like? Satan is proud, isn't he? too proud to submit to the Lord, too, uh, too full of himself to, to bow to his will. That is what made Lucifer fall when he sought to exalt himself over God and his children are just like him, too proud to submit. 
those are the kind of people that you can expect will attack you, even inside the church, sadly. But again, so the, uh, the, in their pride, they're unwilling to submit to God. And what they're unwilling to submit to, of course, is His law. They're not willing to love others. They're not willing to serve others. They're not willing to do what it is that is good for others, which is really everything that is behind the law. And again, I just wanted to remind you of that so that you're never tempted to do the same thing, not to submit to the law of God for whatever reason. One thing we always want to emphasize regarding the law of God is that it is the law of love. It is the true definition of love. And when you don't obey it, you not only offend God, but you hurt and injure yourself and other people. Again, if you want to know Jesus Christ, this is not what he's like. He is not arrogant. He is not proud. He says, I am humble. He is the one who has taken the role of a servant to serve others, to love others, to serve his Father and love and honor him, uh, to love his neighbor as himself by becoming a servant to them and caring for them. That is what is behind the law, and it's only the arrogant, only the, the proud who refuse to submit to authority, even to that which is for their good and for the good of others. Well, again, these are just like their father, the devil. His persecutors were the arrogant, those who are not in accord with your law. Now, sixthly, we see the specific form that their attack took. It wasn't a physical attack. But it was a verbal attack, not surprisingly, because that is the most common method the enemy uses. Verse 86, they have persecuted me with a lie. Help me. The Bible says Satan is a liar, and he is the father of all lies. The way that he normally attacks us, the way that he will usually attack us is, is basically through deception through what we might call psychological warfare. That is the way he will come against us. And you know how effective that is, don't you? Because basically, a lie means if somebody's lying about you, they're slandering you. Has anyone here ever been slandered by somebody else? How debilitating that slander can be, especially when other people believe it, and particularly when people who are close to you believe it. It can separate intimate friends. It can destroy the unity that we have in the body of Christ. It can, as you know, wear you down. Uh, that is the attack he was under. And again, we certainly need to make sure that we never use our mouths uh, to do Satan's will and to attack others in this way because words are much more powerful than anything, any kind of physical damage we might inflict on other people. James warns us about uh, the, the deadly poison that's in the tongue, how it can set a forest on fire. It just takes a little flame, and that's what the tongue is like. You've heard the pen is mightier than the sword. In many senses, it, it is, whether in writing decrees or whether even in just writing down ideas. Ideas are what have shaped the world and have started many wars. We need to be careful with what we say, and we need to make sure that we don't damage other people through our, uh, well, through our words, that we don't lie, we don't slander like the enemy. Now, the end result of all of this was that they almost, these lies almost did him in. In verse 87, they almost destroyed me on earth. Now, in the midst of all this attack, this prolonged, severe attack that was affecting not only his soul, his spiritual well-being, but his physical well-being that had been going on for so long, what was his response? Uh, did he respond the way that we're most often tempted to respond? You lied about me, I'm going to lie about you. You lied about me, I'm going to hate you, I'm going to resent you. Did, did he retaliate? Did he return evil for evil? Did he try to get even? Again, that's what we're tempted to do when things like this happen, when somebody does something evil to us. But notice that even this Old Testament saint knew what it is that the Lord required of him, and that is that he not retaliate, but rather that he do what is right, that he still hold himself to the, uh, to the standard that the Lord held him to, rather than give in to his flesh and fight back using the means that 
those who were attacking him were using. So what is it that he did? Well, verse 83, first of all, he remembered what God told him to do. I do not forget your statutes. He remembered them because he knew they were the right thing to do. Verse 86, all your commandments are faithful. And he continued to obey the Lord, to do what was honoring to him. Verse 87, but as for me, I did not forsake your precepts. And then in verse 88, he even asks for additional strength so that he might be able to do what the Lord wanted him to do. Revive me according to your loving kindness so that I may keep the testimony of your mouth. So his response to the difficulty, his response to the attack, to the lies that were putting him through such anguish, it wasn't get bitter, get even, but it was rather obey. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? If you've been reading the book of Job, you see that's exactly what Job did. He didn't get bitter against the people who attacked him. He didn't get bitter against God, but rather he vindicated God and said, God has every right to do this. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, why was the psalmist so intent on obeying under such a temptation like this to retaliate? Well, the first reason is because he loved the Lord and he wanted to honor his Lord. That's what God would have him to do. That's the reason he made us. He wanted to be, of course, an example to others to follow that example. But again, thirdly, it's also because he knew that only if he obeyed that God would actually deliver him from this. Remember how Paul tells us that, you know, when, when somebody attacks us, that, um, you know, we need to leave room for the wrath of God. If, if our enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. Because in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Leave room for the wrath of God. Uh, in other words, if, if we continue to do what is honoring to the Lord and step out of the way and seek for the good of those who are actually persecuting us and attacking us, God will deal with them. But if we take matters into our own hands, it may be that that's all they're going to get is whatever you know, we dish out to them, and at the same time, we're going to be dishonoring to the Lord. Just because they disobey the Lord, just because they attack us, doesn't give us the right to disobey the Lord and attack them in return. We need to obey the Lord in order to see the Lord do what it is He is going to do. Obedience is the condition that needs to be met before the Lord is going to give what He has promised in this area and really in, in every area. And that moves us to the second point, which is why. Why does God require obedience? Before He will give what He has promised. Is it because God wants to be paid for His blessings? No. Do His blessings have to be earned by us? No. But there is a sense in which there has to be obedience, actually two senses, two different perspectives, okay? Really, the Lord never gives blessing apart from obedience. He doesn't even give salvation apart from obedience, does He? Are we open to the attack of salvation by works? No. The Lord, though, does not give either eternal salvation or even temporal salvation, deliverance from enemies unless there is obedience, unless His righteous requirements are met. But again, this is where the grace of God comes in because He is the one who meets those requirements. You don't have to meet them. Jesus met them and He gives them to you as a free gift by His obedience, by His life, by His death, if you will turn from your sins if you will trust Him, if you will receive Him, if you will walk with Him. That's how you receive the promise of everlasting life. It's through the obedience of Christ. And the same thing is true with regard to all the blessings that flow from salvation. They only come through obedience, but not your obedience. They come through the obedience that Jesus Christ gave on your behalf which is why you need Him, which is why you need to trust Him, because He's the only one who can give them to you. But from another perspective, there is a sense in which we must render personal obedience because that's what we're talking about here. That's what the psalmist is talking about, not the obedience of Christ. That's already understood in his mind. 
uh, the Messiah who was coming, he knows that any good thing that God has for him comes through Jesus Christ. But a person might actually be saved by the righteousness of Jesus Christ and yet still have to personally obey if they are to receive these blessings. And I would say for at least two reasons. And again, the first reason is the same as the same reason that um, basically you must obey if you are actually saved. And that is that evidence, basically obedience is the evidence that the blessings are actually yours. One thing that many people don't understand today is that even though we are not justified by the works that we do, we are justified by the works of Jesus Christ alone, that you cannot be justified apart from works. Remember what James said, show me your faith without the works and I will show you my faith by my works. Faith is the evidence that you have trusted, or excuse me, works are the evidence that you have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. When Jesus saves you, he turns you into a good tree. As the Bible says, a good tree bears good fruit. When Jesus redeems you, he puts his spirit within you to clean your life out from the inside out. And that obedience that results shows that you are the heirs of his salvation. So basically, your works don't earn the salvation, but your works, you know, in, in, well, they, they show, they are the evidence that you are, in fact, justified by God, and they show that you are the heir of that promise of salvation. The same thing is true with regard to all the other blessings that salvation brings. Your obedience is the evidence to you that those promises actually belong to you. There are so many people today who, who profess to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ uh, and yet will not take a step forward uh, to obey Him. And would, you, would you agree with me? There's a number of people like that. They, they won't even go to church or maybe they do go to church but they still live like the rest of the world. When they pick up their Bibles to read it, they're not really concerned about what the Lord wants them to do. They just want to know what the Lord has promised to give them so that they can kind of lay hold of that promise and believe that God's going to give it to them, give them that abundant life or whatever it may be. But they need to understand what it is that Thomas Shepard reminded us of many years ago. And that is, if you want to lay claim to the promises in the Word of God, if you want to embrace those promises, you need to embrace everything that's in Scripture. You need to embrace Jesus Christ as your Savior. You need to embrace Him as your Lord. You need to embrace the commandments. You need to tremble at the threatenings. And if you do all of that, well, then you can lay hold of the promises. But don't expect just to lay hold of the promises and forget about the rest of these things. You have to take the whole Bible or you really can't have any of it. But when you do, you see, that is evidence that you have truly trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ because that is the work that He does in you. And it is purely of His grace. It's not that you're earning those blessings. It's just simply showing that you are the heir of those blessings because you are doing those things. Again, it's the same evidence that you are justified. The fact that you do works. Again, James says, faith without works is dead. I will show you I have saving faith by my works, by the kind of life that I live. If you don't want to obey Jesus, then you really can't expect Him to give you what He has promised because your lack of obedience shows that you really don't belong to Him and He really hasn't made those promises to you. If you want to know those promises belong to you, you need to obey Him from the heart willingly because you have the Spirit of God in you. So that's one perspective or one reason why we must obey if we are to expect to receive anything from God. But the second reason you need to obey is, again, one that we've seen a lot about recently, and I'll just mention it quickly. If you don't obey the Lord, then He will withhold His blessings from you as an act of discipline. I mean, He typically doesn't bless if you're living in disobedience so that you'll repent and begin to obey Him the way that you should. One of the ways that He disciplines, of course, is by bringing 
difficulties into our lives. And why would he remove the difficulty if the reason he brought it was to get you to repent? Remember, repentance and obedience are the same thing. Oh, repentance is turning from the wrong things I'm doing and doing the right things. That's what obedience is all about. So why would God remove discipline if he's disciplining you for a lack of obedience if you're not obeying? You have to obey. If you're going to expect to receive his promise, which in this case would be the removal of the difficulty which the Lord has brought for some good reason. And by the way, we don't necessarily assume that the psalmist here was disobeying God and that God was, was disciplining him for disobedience. Uh, you don't have to sin for the Lord to bring difficulties, do you? Uh, sometimes he wants to teach you something that he can only teach you through difficulties. That's the way he does teach us. And he's just simply expecting you to, to learn certain things, perhaps to trust him more, to hold on to him more, to hold on to his promises, to wait expectantly for him as the psalmist was doing. It may not have a particular sin in view, but it still has something in view that the Lord wants you to learn. It's still an act, discipline, remember, is not always corrective, but it is always instructive. Uh, so it has a, a broader meaning. So yes, blessings do come through obedience. They come through the obedience of Christ. He's the one who purchases them for us. But we can't really lay, lay hold of, the, uh, of these promises uh, unless we see the fruits of obedience in our life. We really can't know that those promises belong to us or expect God to answer them if we're living disobedient lives. Plus, um, we can't expect the Lord to remove the difficulty if He happens to have brought that difficulty because of a lack of obedience. We need to obey before we can see that, that obedience or that, uh, that promise, that deliverance. And then thirdly, again, the Lord may have brought it for another reason entirely, still to teach us something, in which case we still need to obey, and that's what he's trying to teach us is, is closer obedience in order that we might see his uh, answer to prayer, his, his promises fulfilled, his deliverance. And so applying this, let's just look at a couple of things. What if you are experiencing difficulties? and looking to the Lord to give you something that He doesn't seem to be granting. Well, I believe this passage challenges us to examine ourselves in at least two areas. The first is, are we His child? Do the promises belong to us? Are you trusting Jesus Christ? Does your life show that you are trusting Him? Remember, the promises don't belong to you unless you belong to Him, and the way that you can know you belong to Him is that you are obeying Him, which is why faith by itself, which really can't exist by itself, but some people believe it does, faith really can't exist by itself. Faith alone isn't enough. It has to be faith and repentance. It has to be faith and obedience. That is how you know that you belong to the Lord. That is how you know that you have the promise of eternal life. And that's how you know all the promises belong to you. If you're looking to the Lord for something and you're not obeying Him, you may not even possess those promises. You need to trust in the Lord. You need to repent of your sins. He's not going to give you anything until you do. But if you've trusted Him, and you are obeying or at least seeking to obey Him. I should say, if you belong to Him and you're not, you're not obeying, you certainly need to straighten out your life before He will answer your prayers. You do need to repent. We do have a promise in Scripture that if you are repenting, if you are obeying and you're trusting the Lord, that when you ask God for the things that He has promised, that He will hear you. And again, here's a New Testament passage that reminds us of the very thing we just saw in the Old Testament, uh, what we saw in Psalm 18, what we see in our passage, and that is that if we obey, God will give us the promises, and that's in 1 John 3, 18 through 24. John writes, little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. By the way, this goes very well with what we saw this morning. We will know by this that we are of the truth and will assure our heart before Him in whatever our heart condemns us. 
for God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from Him because we keep His commandments and do the things that are pleasing in His sight. This is His commandment, that we believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as He commanded us. The one who keeps His commandments abides in Him, and He in Him. And we know by this that He abides in us by the Spirit whom He has given us. Notice the one who keeps His commandments abides in Him. Who is the one who is in Jesus Christ? The one who keeps His commandments. How do we know that we can lay claim to the promises of God? Whatever we ask, we receive from Him because we keep His commandments and do the things that are pleasing in His sight. That's how we can know that God has heard us and that we will receive what it is He has promised us. So if we've trusted Him and know that Jesus has purchased those promises for us, if we are obeying Him, that is the evidence to us that we belong to Him, that the promises belong to Him, and that we know when we ask something from Him, He will hear us and He will give it to us because we have the evidence of His Sonship in our lives. But again, remember that you may be doing still what it is God commands you to do. You may be doing what you need to do and still not receive what He has promised because it isn't the right time, because there's something more the Lord wants to teach you through your waiting upon Him. And in that case, what you need to do is simply wait on the Lord for His timing, wait on the Lord for what it is He's seeking to teach you, try to learn what it is He's trying to teach you, and submit to that, and then the Lord will give you what you have asked for in His time. So let this be an encouragement, really, to all of us this evening to love the Lord and to trust Him more that we might obey Him more so that we might receive more of what it is He has promised. The key is love because the more we love Him, the more we will obey Him, and the more we obey Him, the more He is going to be disposed to answer our prayers and to give us what He has promised except in the case where He may withhold it because He wants to teach us other things. We need to trust Him, turn from our sins. We need to pursue Him. We need to love Him, obey Him. And if we do, He will give us those things. But again, love is the key. So how do we love Him more? Well, here's one thing I thought I would just throw into the mix. You know, there are things that, there's so many things. And here's, I believe, a very important thing. If you are to love the Lord, certainly you need to use the means of grace. You need more of the Holy Spirit. You need to make sure you don't quench the Spirit's work. Okay, that's something we're very familiar with. But one thing that we often do that quenches the Spirit's work that maybe we don't hear it in these terms, maybe we're not aware of it, is we need to make sure that we do not let our hearts get divided. A divided heart will not be able to love God the way we need to love Him if we are to obey Him the way He wants us to. Your heart must not be divided between Jesus Christ and anything else. Do you realize everything the Lord calls you to do, He wants you to do basically out of your love for Him? Even loving your enemies, you are, you are to do that because of your love for Christ. Love your spouse, love your children, love your neighbor, love God. All of this is supposed to be out of your love for the Lord Jesus Christ. You cannot let your heart get divided. You cannot love Jesus Christ and then divide your love between Him and the world. If you do that, it's going to grieve and quench the Holy Spirit. To the degree that you do that, it's going to weaken your love. To that degree, it's going to weaken your obedience. To that degree, you are not going to be able to receive the promises of God. So if you want those promises, then you must love Him with an undivided heart. You must be devoted to Him. Delight in Him, the Scripture says. Again, as Spurgeon reminded us not too long ago. Delight in Him and He will give you the desires of your heart. But you have to have a heart devoted to Him. May the Lord give us such a heart that we may love Him in this way and that we may obey Him 
so that we might receive His promises and His blessings. Let's, let's bow in a moment of prayer, and let's ask the Lord to help us um, love Him more and obey Him more.